Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Dave Honorado. Brett Shaw. So today we're going to talk about how to buy guitars online where you can't actually play them, which is pretty much what most people do. As a matter of fact, this guitar I bought online, this guitar I bought online, and this Rhett, guitar I bought online completely sight unseen. Now let's, I want to tell the stories of these two guitars. So one day I'm sitting having coffee in my backyard and I'm talking to Rhett and I, was, I look up Pelham Blue Les Paul. I said, I really want to get a Pelham Blue Les Paul. So as I'm talking to Rhett, I say, wow, check this out. And I send it to him and you said... It's at a store, one of my favorite stores I've ever been to called Action Music outside of Washington, D.C. I had been there a few years earlier while on tour. And uh, yeah, it was a perfect, perfect guitar. I said, send the guy a message. He's super cool. And... Ten minutes later, you had the guitar on the way. But I bought the guitar because Rhett had knew of the shop. I and, knew of the shop. The reputation. I had, I had been there. I met the owner. Um, it was a, an amazing shop. People in the area probably know it. And uh, so, yeah, it was it, it knowing that it came from a reputable place that I had been and seen. It was a pretty safe bet. I thought. Yes, and when I got it, it was even better than I had hoped. The color, everything about it was was amazing. This guitar I found on Reverb, and I sent it to Dave. Well, we looked for a while, actually. Tell him why about Deluxes in the years, Dave. Well, he was looking for a Deluxe, and um, the 68, 69, 70 were too expensive. So I told him, I said, try to find maybe like a 71 to 73 that are a little less expensive, and uh, but basically the same guitar. And, and, I, and I didn't want a gold top. I actually wanted a blue sparkle. Yeah, and those were like ten grand in nice shape. So, <laughs> right. so that was that was like, all right, let's go down a little bit. And I figured, well, you already got a blue standard, so let's. Right, uh, so I was like, yeah, no, ten yeah. grand, no. Um, so he sent me a few different things uh, on eBay, a couple on Reverb, and of the bunch of ones that he sent me, I went through each ad and kind of looked at it, each one of them, and this was the most uh, original one of the bunch. It's a '72. Uh, see-through cherry red top, which is kind of rare. Um, most of these were sunburst or gold tops uh, or tobacco bursts. Um, and it had it had that. Uh, and what what is the back? The back. So that's mahogany, right? Yeah, it's mahogany, painted, mahogany yeah. neck. Two and, piece body. Uh, yeah, it's a sandwich body, um, three piece top. I just noticed that for the first time just now. <laughs> yeah, sandwich body. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, larger headstock with a smaller volute, but it's not it's not real big and. Um, but and, basically, and, and, and this particular year, what year? Seventy two. Seventy two. And tell them about seventy two. Tell them about the the time period when you don't want to buy less balls typically. Well, there, my personal preference for for deluxes or every anything from sixty eight to about seventy four because they have the mahogany necks. Um, after that, seventy five to like eighty one, they had maple necks, which yep. totally changes the tone of the guitar. Um, and believe it or not, they're prone to warping. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of Les Pauls that I see in the late 70s that have bad uh, twisted necks and headstocks. Um, and I'm not sure why, because you'd think maple would be stronger than mahogany. But uh, And the mahogany ones do it too, but for some reason the maple necks are even worse. Now one of the things in the picture, and this is what, what you deal with, what you what you don't know, is this cra crack here. Now Dave, I, I sent, Dave said, ask the guy for pictures of it. So we could see it cl more closely. Yeah, I had I made sure to get all details really, you know, as much, as many pictures as I could as far as close up shots. And what I was looking for was to see if this was actually cracked or whether it was just finish checking. And actually, this is just finish checking. It's from somebody's hand sitting here and actually sweating. And you can see where the bridge it sweated. You know, they had real acidic, you know, uh, sweat. Probably playing uh, from from uh, like uh, thirty eight special songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, but, I think that was done on a deluxe, wasn't that maybe? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Carlisi played a gold top. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> um, but this was just a, a finish flaw. It wasn't anything serious. So that as soon as I saw that it wasn't anything, uh, you know, b a big deal. It was like okay. Um, but you always want to ask for for extra pictures if they're not represented. Yeah, especially. Uh, you know, anytime you can't go and play the guitar or see it in person, um, the three things I look for right off the bat on any guitar is I look for the alignment of both the high E strings and how they sit on the neck. Um, 
you'll see like it's less so in on a Les Paul or maybe Gibson's, but um, unless they've been broken and the neck's been reset and not reset right, then the high E can be hanging off or the low E can be hanging off. Uh, but it's typically like on parts casters or fenders. You'll see, oh, you know, guys who put guitars together and they'll tout it, oh, it's so great, it's all great. And then you look, I look and, and I'll see the high E hanging off the edge of the fingerboard <laughs> and the bridge is in the wrong spot. And it's really common. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many guitars I get, you know, parts caster guitars. Well, I got this, you know, I got a Squire body and I want to put a, you know, a USA neck on it. And literally, you know, I don't understand why the, you know, strings hanging off. Any. So the first thing I do is I look for the alignment of the high E strings and low E strings. Because, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's not funny when you Dave, get it and then you're like trying to play it and you can't fret it. Because okay, so know. the joke earlier was Dave said, you take, take a $600 guitar. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was I, it? I, so I just bought a casino, a Chinese casino for 700 bucks. Yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, I want to swap the pickups out, do some stuff. And he's like, cool. So you put... Yeah, replace all the parts on it. <laughs> put fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars in, and then you've got an eight hundred dollar guitar. Yeah, right? Exactly, yeah, so, and that yeah. is that is the, the case with parts casters, man. If if you're thinking about building a parts caster or upgrading your own guitar, like yeah, you're not gonna get that money out of it unless you put it back to stock, sell it as it yeah. is, and then <laughs> right. out the extra parts. Right, right, you know. So, yeah. uh, but first, like I said, I look for alignment on guitars. Uh, any obvious like cracks, especially on obvious like Gibson's, uh, you, know, you yeah, want to look for cracks up in here, heel, you know, breaks. Um, and then any kind of, um, you know, guitars that have been what I like to call road hard, put up wet, that are really beat to death. Um, a lot of times they'll have work problems with the neck and it's just because of age, sweat, you know, and the fact that they were played to death. Um, and so that opens up a can, another can of worms too. Like you want to look for um, if the guitars have been refretted, how well they were refretted. Uh, I see a lot of Les Pauls that, unfortunately, uh, up up in these areas here where these crown inlays are, or even on the dots on on like a, a 335 or, or SG or something. Um, if the if the board is pulled up and it's got a hump in the top, well, when they go to plane it, they'll burn right through these inlays and these inlays get really thin looking. And that's how you can tell if the guitar actually had a bad hump in the neck. And instead of taking it out of the fret wire, they took it out of the top of the fingerboard. And once you start taking wood off a guitar, you can't add it. So things like that, definitely. So don't be forward. afraid to yeah. ask for pictures. Yeah, Although no, Dave no. Is like, says to me, uh, hey, see if the guy's got a, <laughs> got a, uh, a a little ruler and he can measure the the string height or something. I'm like, "Dave, who Well, no, it depends it depends. If it's a sh if I know it's a shop, they're they'll copping it. it. Yeah. Uh, they'll do that for you. You know, a private owner, I don't expect that. Mm -hmm. So, um and I hate to say it, but you know, even even if you know what you're looking at, you I I've been burned three or four times on eBay and it was simply by people who were fraudulent and trying to pass off something that, you know, like I, had, I bought a guitar that guy said was totally fine. It looked totally fine in, in pictures, went through everything. I get the guitar and the truss rod was frozen. You know, of course the guy claims, oh, well, you know, it wasn't like that. It was fine. I was like, well, you know, what are you going to do? But uh, so if you can, obviously, like these guys said, buy from a reputable dealer, you know, or somebody at least where maybe you can get a 48-hour approval on something. Yes. So once you get the guitar, you can send it back if there's a problem. Um, otherwise, you know, it's like going to Vegas. It's a crapshoot. So, so know. Rhett, that guitar, tell, tell us about, about that. Yeah, so this is a Bourgeois Slope D. So it's basically like a Gibson J45. Um, Looks exactly the same shape. Yeah, so... And kind of with a Martin headstock in a way. Yeah. Yep. I bought this guitar almost 10 years ago. Um, I had a, a Taylor 916 that I had bought. I had to borrow the money, and it took forever to pay it back. And I was really excited about the Taylor until I got it and started playing it live and it just sounded horrible plugged up um sorry if anyone at taylor's watching but it just no offense it didn't work and so i lucked out i sold it for a little bit more than what i paid for it and this was from an acoustic guitar forum this guitar was owned by a collector of bourgeois or bourgeois um, up in maine and he was selling this because apparently he thought the lower bout was too big for him and it was uncomfortable for him to play sitting down. So um, it was, I think, a couple of years old at that point, and it was a little bit more than what I had, but it was a couple hundred dollars to step up into a nicer guitar. And I figured that, well, if, you know, I'm not able to play this, 
And at the time, I didn't know Dave, so I didn't have anyone to reference it. <laughs> with, you know, um, so I bought it, and it showed up a few days later, and I lucked out. It's an amazing guitar. This is my number one acoustic. It has a pickup in it. I just noticed. Yeah, I, I installed a KRK Pure Mini volume because I wanted like the least amount of crap inside the guitar possible. I didn't want batteries yeah. and preamps and all this garbage. So this is just a, uh, I believe it's an under saddle passive pickup with a volume That's control good. right here. And um, it's literally just a couple wires that goes to an output jack. But this guitar sounds amazing and it's aged. I've had it for almost 10 years now and I can tell it's opened up and changed since yeah. I got it. Um, but yeah, I lucked out on this one. I think buying acoustics online sight unseen is a pretty treacherous thing to do yeah my insurance policy was well if i get it and it doesn't work and it's not for me i'm pretty confident that because i'm buying it secondhand I, someone else has already eaten the depreciation on it and i could at least get my money back out of it and sell it on to someone else locally um you know yeah, yeah. Right, right so i have a guitar that i've been looking for it's a uh, and i'm going to put it out after this this video i'm going to i'm going to hopefully buy one before this video comes out but it's a, a guild d40c cutaway guitar cuz i want to have a i want to have a guitar that i keep that's a six string guitar that i keep in a nashville tuning i have a cheap yamaha 12 string that i have tuned as a nashville tune, uh, tuned guitar but it's a cheap guitar. All the pegs rattle, mm -hmm. uh, just because there, there's nothing on yeah. them. And yeah. and you want to have a dedicated. I mean, I want to have a dedicated. Do you guys have dedicated Nashville guitars, mm -hmm. or is that common to have? I don't even know. Yeah, I, I did a video on that a few months ago, and I have an Epiphone acoustic that stays Nashville tuned, and that Dan Electro that I bought, the NOS Plus, stays yeah. Nashville tuned. Okay, so is that a something with the neck, Dave? That you want to? Um, is there? Well, the Nashville tuning. Um, it's a higher tuning. So, yeah, I would use, you know, be mindful of uh, adjusting the neck out after you get it set up for the Nashville tuning. Um, but it should be fine otherwise. Now, um, this guitar is that I'm looking for is from the 70s. Now, Dave yeah. said, to, we, so we looked at two listings on Reverb. And you couldn't really tell a lot from them. One said it was in excellent condition. And ones that it was in good condition. Now they're always in excellent condition. They're always in excellent. I mean, how excellent can it be? <laughs> it's you know? mint. Yeah. I mean, right. it no, has, no matter what, it's it had scratches beautiful. on it and dead had dead. dents and scratches on it. I was like, come right. on, excellent. That's that's. Right. Uh, well, that's, and what and what I told him was, and just from past experience of owning a lot of them, working on a lot of them, uh, '70s guilds can be really hit and miss. Um, they they're known for having shallow neck angle, which you know, like where the neck meets here, so it's a little shallow and the bridge is high, so you got high action on them. The particular guitar he's looking at has a cutaway in it, so which gives it even less structural integrity up top where the neck meets the body. So typically they have a lot of problems with them. Um, and I'm not bashing go guitars, I love go guitars, but they inherently for some reason 60s 70s 80s guilds have a lot of they can be if they haven't been maintained well they can be a okay so one of the things though was the dave said look at the set you, there's not a good picture of the saddle um yeah yeah so like when on an acoustic if you're looking at uh, buying an acoustic see how you want this this actual saddle to be high off the bridge the more the closer it is to the actual bridge means that somebody's actually had to sand it down to get the action down which means typically that the neck set is probably not that great on the guitar um, sometimes it can mean if the guitar is completely acoustic and it doesn't have a pickup in it and you've got the bridge all the way down when you go to add a piezo pickup under say like a martin thin line uh acoustic pickup which most people you know use you're you instantly when you put the pickup in it it's going to raise the bridge saddle up so instantly your action's going to be up so you can have it cut all the way down and have it even the neck as flat as you can get it and the action will be okay but when you go to put a pickup in it it's going to raise that up and without shaving the bridge down and doing a lot of work to it um you know it can be kind of a hassle so um so when you're buying an acoustic i always tell three things look for big any kind of big cracks behind the bridge if the bridge is pulling mm -hmm. if the saddle's too low or if if you the neck angle where the 
uh, fretboard meets the, the body. If you've got a lot of angle like this, or the, the top is actually how can you tell that? Oh, you just tell from the pictures. Yeah, you t I, that's what I tell people: take side shots of, of how the bridge. You know, get a shot of the guitar like that, and look at the bridge and where the neck is, and see how much play you've got in it. Um, and the, the deeper it is, you know, the, the worse off the action's going to be. So, what about questions that you should ask the seller for? What's on an acoustic, for example? So. Should you ask things like, has it had a neck reset? Yeah. Has it ever yeah. been cracked and repaired? Like, what are some things you should ask? I would definitely, first of all, ask um, if there's any kind of cracks involved that have been fixed uh, to get detailed photos of those. See and ask them if they had the work done or if they bought the guitar that way. Um, because sometimes, you know, you can uh, it, you find somebody who bought a guitar, and if they know the guy who repaired it, they can refer him to you, you and you can actually talk to the guy that repaired it, which, you know, is great sometimes, too, because he can tell you a lot more about the guitar than maybe the owner actually knows. Um, it's kind of like buying a used car. It, it really is, um, especially in acoustics. Electrics are a little bit less problematic, but um, acoustics, you know, they've got, they're a lot more fragile. Um, the other big thing about uh, acoustics and on any guitar is when you're buying from a private owner, do they know how to pack it and ship oh, it yeah. to where <laughs> it'll show up and it's not in five pieces, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've had a lot, I've had probably a half a dozen really great guitars ruined by people who didn't know how to pack the guitar and simply put it with like, well, I just put it in the case and I detuned it and then I gave it to UPS and it was smashed. Um, I bought a, uh a Les Paul, a 74 Les Paul Custom yeah. that was white yeah. that showed up with the headstock broken off. I've had some guitars that showed up like that and, and where there was no damage to the case, but the guitar was busted. A good drop, even when a case like flat, you know, can do that. Um, but uh, either way, though, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is if you can buy from a store, typically stores, they'll know how to pack the guitar much but better. They'll the correct boxes and things yeah. like and that. And I'm not saying that FedEx and UPS won't trash it during shipping but yeah. uh, at least stores typically that, that sell guitars know how to pack stuff a lot better than a private seller typically um, I've had even I've had a couple of vintage guitars uh, I bought a 54 uh, gold top one time and I told the guy do not ship the guitar I'll pick it up and I actually drove 800 miles to get the guitar because I didn't trust mm -hmm. him or UPS to deliver it in yeah I mean piece. depending on what you're buying if you're in that vintage yeah. high dollar game I mean yeah. what what else is a plane ticket on top of your whatever right. you're spending for a guitar to go pick it up and bring it back to or, guarantee that it shows up right yeah, yeah. So. so with with that in mind like what are some things you can do on the, the negotiating front with a private seller you know because right now gear prices used are gear prices are crazy. insane yeah um yeah. so how do you go about you know negotiating prices for a specific guitar how do you do research to know where the market is at on a certain guitar? Um, usually the best indication is just go back and see what the last similar model sold for in the recent time frame um, on Reverb or, or eBay or, or even uh, stores that have them in stock or just recently sold them. Yeah, what they um, sold for, not what they're listed right, for. Right, right. Um, Dave has this thing about saying, when I ask him what a guitar is worth, he'll tell me it's always about... Four hundred dollars less than what the, all the guitars sell for. <laughs> Always, typically, yeah. I'll be, I'll be. Well, yeah. they're selling it for for eighteen hundred, Dave. Well, that's a fourteen hundred dollar guitar. <laughs> it's like, well, it's and, always four hundred dollars less than what you say it is. Well, but the thing is, is the guitar. The reason I say that is for two two reasons. <laughs> um, one, if you find a, a deal that's too good to be true, it is. Mm -hmm. Don't buy it because I guarantee you there's some hidden thing going on with it or they're scamming or whatever. So that, that always rings true. Um, but okay, say you got a $2,000 Les Paul, okay? And you figure, okay, if the market's really hot right now and it's, it's totally uh, a seller's market, um, you know, they're not going to come off the price that much. I mean, know? I didn't pay 2000 for this guitar. I think I paid 1800 for it, something like that. It was, yeah, it was right about, yeah. How much would a guitar like this go for this now, This is, that, man, uh, uh, something, yeah. probably five grand with this car. What? Wait, that's a, what year is that? 72, Deluxe. Okay. Yeah. 
This guitar's in great shape. That's why I told you I mean, to buy it. It's in really, really yeah. good shape. I mean, I cleaned it up really well, but yeah. it, it's but it's all there. The only thing that's... Uh, I mean, we would look for a long time to find it, because it was hard yeah. to find one that wasn't yeah. a gold top. It's yeah, hard to it was find. hard to find one that wasn't broken, wasn't modified, and didn't have like neck problems and cracks and things like that. So, so on Reverb currently, there's two. There's a, a Cherry Burst mm -hmm. listed at 3600 and there's a Gold Top listed at six. Yeah. This color is probably one of the rarest colors for, for a deluxe that I've seen. So that's what was another reason why I was like, if you really like the color, get it because they're hard to find the solid cherry ones. So, yeah. Yeah, but also be willing to wait, you know, yeah. unless you're in a situation where you have to have a, a piece of gear for, for you know, this is uh, this is something I think right now it's like try and let the market cool off a little bit. I, I wouldn't be trying to buy. I mean, I rarely buy guitars I almost never buy guitars, and when I do, I will look for them for months and months or years even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, well, like your white custom, it, it was like two years to find that. Yeah, finally. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and there was guitars that he would send me ads on, and it was like, I think I'm going to buy this. I'm like, don't buy it. Yeah. It's actually too much money. Let it sit, and then it would sit, and the price would come down, and then we'd find something better anyway. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. just how yeah. it is. It, it yeah. was it was literally two years to find yeah. that white custom. Yeah. Yeah. Before Dave's like, oh, this is a good one. And he, Dave will send me the stuff when he finds something that's good, he'll send it to me. Yeah, if, um, oh, I'll show it to you. Yeah. If it's, uh, if he knows I'm looking for something, or I'll tell him I'm looking for a particular thing. I rarely am looking, Rhett knows this, I rarely look here, for guitars. Wait, change the green screen so I can get <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah come sorry. on back. Oh, your green screen, yeah. green screen swap green there. Screen, yeah. Special so. effects. Yeah, so this one, uh, this was a 90, I think. Yeah. 91. Yeah. And, um, this was he was looking for. Uh, I wanted one that was yellow. Had yellowed already. Yeah, slightly. Yeah. 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 Um, and white customs. If you are into these guitars, uh, they are typically hard to find that aren't modified, aren't broken, mm -hmm. or just beat to death. Um, so the first one we got was a '74, and unfortunately that one got broke. So then it was like, okay, well, what else can we find? And this one popped up, and. I personally think this is actually one of the better ears for customs. It's, they've got really nice dish tops in them. They're, you know, like more like a '50s style dish top. More, more, uh, more accentuated. Yeah, uh, no volute in the headstock, mahogany neck, a good weight. They're not super heavy, they, but they've got a nice weight to them. Um, and the fit and finish on these was great. Yeah. So the, or the late '80s, early '90s, I always tell people if you're looking for something that isn't super vintage and high end, uh, you know, like ten grand or more. Um, these are like in the five to six, four to six range right now. Um, maybe but, a little but, more. But, but I did not pay that much for yeah, it. Yeah, no, this one was like 38, I think. So let's say, hypothetically, and this is sort of a hypothetical. So um, a few weeks ago, I got to go see Jason Isbell and the 400 unit here at Tabernacle. And Sadler yeah. Vaden was playing a Rickenbacker, uh, Rickenbacker, um, 330 Fire Glow. And I... Yeah. I've wanted a Rick for a long time, and that show inspired me to, to start looking for one. So I know a little bit about them. I know that early 90s is probably the era to go for, early to mid 90s. So how would you go about researching and finding all the things we've talked about on a guitar I'm not super, super familiar with, I've never owned one, so I don't know the issues to look for, I don't know the right years to look for, how would you, if you're just starting from square one, how would you start your search? Um, first and foremost, a couple of avenues. Um, there's some really good Rickenbacker books out there that you can look as far as reference books that have a lot of good information. It kind of gives you, goes through all the eras and the differences between those. Um, and then go on um, Rickenbacker forum groups. And there's, there's so many geek nerd guitar players out there. You can pretty much just look at... Um, uh, blogs of, of people talking about stuff and surmise kind of what people like and what they don't like about certain models or certain years. Um, Rickenbacker is, they're kind of all over the place. Um, and and I, I love Rickenbackers, but the only thing I don't like about Rickenbackers is they tend to be overly expensive for no reason just because people push the prices up. Mm -hmm. And so 
Um, every once in a while you can find a really good deal on a Rick, um, but typically you pay a lot of money for Rick. And so I had a yeah. black one. Yeah. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I loved the guitar. It played really well, but no one that I worked with, because I was working with metal bands, so it didn't fit in a lot. And when I wanted to use it for an overdub, no one could play it in tune because <laughs> the neck was smaller Small on neck, it. Yeah. And... I, it was like I was the only one that could play it in tune, so it wasn't. I don't know why I didn't just keep it. There, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it really played well. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a good guitar. Yeah. Well, I think part of this discussion too is not just buying the right guitar, but like selling gear. Everyone has the story of the the gear that they regret selling, and for me, I I kind of have this little. Um, this little rule, which is if you're going to sell something, it should, unless it's for, you know, you got to pay the bills. But if you're going to sell something to get into a different piece of gear or a newer piece of gear, you should always sell something to move forward or to move up, right? You should never sell something to, to make a lateral move because I find that that's usually when you regret the sale. Uh, my Novo, Saris J, my pink sparkle guitar, I sold... Two guitars, a bunch of pedals, yep. who had a credit card. I mean, it took everything for me to buy that guitar. But because it was so much of a step <clears throat> up from anything I had at the time, I don't... I mean, I miss the two guitars I have, but I don't regret selling them because yeah. it was the right move at the right time. So I think that's something important to keep, keep in mind. I agree. I think, um, like we were talking about before, the impulse buy... Uh, on something or like you know you find something you're like you start doing the mind game of like oh i've got to have it i gotta have this that's usually the red flag right off the bat like you know hold off it's it might not be a great idea and usually i've talked myself into something and then i talk myself out of something luckily uh a few times uh, without too much trouble but you know it's it I, I definitely agree though it's like if you can take some you know two or three items and get something much better with those three items mm -hmm. and a little money or something yeah that's usually always a better way to go um, well i'll do stuff know. like i bought that white strat at um yeah. i bought yeah, the yeah, strat yeah. that i don't know what year that was that uh it was just a, a, like a early 2000s early 2000s yeah. strat but American it had a nice Standard. body and the pickups had been swapped out i bring it back and i but and the neck was terrible on it but it was yeah. it was really discounted because it was you know, like a player guitar, you know, old, yeah. old guitar. So I bring it back. Dave takes a look at it and said, let's get a custom neck for this. So we ordered a neck from Warmoth for it that took forever to come in. Yeah. And uh, But it's a great neck on it. And, and it, I mean, it's transformed the guitar. Yeah. Really. Right. But Dave convinced me to keep the pickups... Yeah, the, bo the body was good and the pickups were fine. I said, well, if the neck is the only thing you don't like, we can easily swap that out. And then we kind of custom specced out a neck because he, he wanted something completely different than the Fender. And so it was it was a fairly easy transition on it. Um, uh, but, but I bought the guitar knowing that I was going to... Yeah, mod it. Mod it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously with Fender stuff, it's a lot easier to do that than with like a Gibson or something. But... Um, so is there something about like buying a Fender versus buying a Gibson, Dave, that, that guitars that have bolt-on necks are easier to deal with? Um, in the modding end of things, yeah. I mean, I, Or you I, know what you're getting. It's, they're, they're easier. If something's wrong with the guitar, they're easier to fix. Mm, not necessarily. I mean, Fenders have their issues, too. Um, like we were talking about the alignment problems and things like that. Um, and then... It, Fenders are strange too because you, uh, you would think, well, you're just going to bolt up two pieces and it'll be fine. I, you know, I've done I've done mods for people where we put certain necks on certain bodies and it sounded like garbage, and then we changed the neck, put another one, on, and it was great. So it, it's just the kind of luck of the draw with that too. But um, uh, but like the warmth neck that we got, I made sure that was certain things about it where it was like quarter sawn uh maple. I still don't know what that means. It's the way they cut the actual neck stock. Okay. Um, I'm with you. I've seen and I've, I've, I've heard seen term, carpenters describe it, and I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. It's basically okay. It, it, the dumbest way I can describe it. <laughs> okay, the, here's a here, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the here's, 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 here's a tree it. stock. You lay the log down. Okay. Well, if you if you look at the log and the log's laying this way, and they cut the neck just as if the if the the neck was just like the log laying there. Yeah. That's flat sawn. 
So okay. it goes with the grain. Well, the problem with flats on is those warp like crazy and they're not stable at all. A quarter saw is you take the, the blade and you quarter saw it at a different angle. Oh. So the grain in the wood is actually stronger and it warps less. Um, so typically quarter saw necks um, tend to be, especially on a maple neck, tend yeah. to be super stable. So um, they're not as pretty looking as the grain maybe, but that's right. if you're looking for stability though, that's the way to go. Um, that's not necessarily true with all kind of wood, but it, maple definitely for sure. So Interesting. Um, but, and you know, there again, uh, it's just like anything, you know, um, <laughs> uh, part, you know, like doing parts caster builds and things like that. Um, you know, you learn a lot by putting stuff together that way. Um, and that's actually how I learned a lot about building guitars, custom guitars, and doing all this work that I do and stuff. Um, you know, I highly suggest taking a body and a neck, putting it together, and working on it yourself. And you, you can figure out a lot of issues with guitars and working on your own guitars that way. And you did that, right? Not worry about it. Yeah, you yeah, also well, ruin. Ruin. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have someone like Dave on, on speed dial to fix your mistakes. <laughs> yeah, we barely fixed that one. Uh, but yeah, no, God. it was, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, but hey, it's, you, you, you live, you know, you learn by living. So it's, yeah. it's at least, uh, uh, I, you know, people always come to me, they're like, well, I want to take the Squire and I want to change all these parts or like your casino. And it's fine. It's totally cool. But the thing you got to remember is a lot of parts will not interchange. You're going to have to do some modding. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, everything just doesn't bolt up. Like, and of course, I don't care what it's people say on the internet. Well, this neck will fit right on it. I guarantee you, eighty percent of the time when they tell you, "Oh, it'll bolt right up," it never does. <laughs> it doesn't. I, I believe me. I live that nightmare every day at my shop. So, oh, I got this neck and this body. It's you know. Oh man. Yeah. But um, so when you're buying parts like that, try to buy parts from the same manufacturer, the same you know, like a Warmoth neck and body. Those will fit together. A fender body and neck will fit together. Start mixing and matching. That's where you got problems. So yeah. this is a really timely video. I know a lot of people are out there looking for stuff on Reverb, on eBay, yeah. and buying things online from shops. So do your homework and don't be afraid, as Dave said, to ask for more pictures and more information. Yeah. And buy stuff on a credit card so you can reverse it if you have to. Oh, that's a good point. Because that's another somewhat way to kind of be, you know, protected. Yeah. Leave your comments in the comment section. Don't forget to follow Dave at... Dojo Guitar Repair on and, Instagram. And DM him with all of your guitar sales questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's definitely got the time totally, yeah. to answer. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And follow Rhett. YouTube. All the stuff, man. Everywhere. Thanks for watching. That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, and leave a comment. Check out my new Quick Lessons Pro guitar course that just came out. Also, the Beato book, if you want to learn about music theory, that's how you do it. And check out my Beato ear training course at beatoeartraining.com. And don't forget, if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks so much for watching.